Great to have you with us here live on Speed. Petit Le Mans, powered by Mazda 6, continues. Flag to flag coverage, or rain shower to rain shower coverage, more like it. We are under caution again. And this is as a combination of those spins, cars on the track and the rainfall and track condition. Let's go to the pit road. Chris Neville with an update on Corvette Racing. Well, the three car did come in and they took a good look at it, making sure all the rocks and debris were out of the wheel wells, the wheels, make sure nothing was in the brakes. The car looked good, so Johnny O'Connell back on the racetrack. But I did sneak down the right side of the car and took a look at where they fuel the car. And we know that that trap door had broken off during the last fuel stop. And, and that trap door is no longer there. So essentially, where you put that probe into the car, there's a cylinder there that's about a foot and a half to two feet long that now does not have a trap door over it, so any debris could potentially go down into that cylinder. And that, now, obviously, there's, there's going to be filters in the fuel cell that can remove that debris before it goes into the engine. But look at all this rain now, Dorsey. All this rain going into that cylinder, and then when they go to refuel the car, that water could potentially be going into the fuel cell. And that will be a problem, because I doubt they have a fuel separator filter. Something else, Chris, under the three car, something's dragging on the racetrack and making a lot of sparks. Right Right dead center in the front when we get a front shot you'll see that there's something that's loose on that car i don't really know i can't identify what it is but whatever it is it's metal because it's sparking like mad i can tell you this too this is the most miserable a race car driver can ever be right now take a look here look under the center of the front of the race car you're going to start seeing sparks see you see the sparks yeah something dragging down in there i can't really say what that is but it's not supposed to be there um, you're not going fast enough behind the pace car for the water to go around the car and over you, so you're getting drenched. In these open cockpit cars, these guys are freezing right now. They're drenched to the bone. Once you get going fast, that water and the air blows it around you. you don't, you're in a vacuum. You, you don't get wet. That's what Alan McNish was telling me yesterday, that you only get wet behind the safety car. And we have received reports, and we now see it reflected on our timing and scoring screen. This red race has been red flagged. Pits, I'll come down and look at it. Nobody touched the car. Now, what that means is all the cars will be brought in. They'll all come to a stop. No one can work or touch the car. The driver can sit in the car. They'll probably mandate that they sit there as they try to wait this out. And I'm hearing that that Corvette, that sparking, is the left side exhaust. After he's been off in the gravel, it's torn the exhaust down. And that's what, uh, that's what it is rubbing, which isn't good either because if it ho makes a hole there, the exhaust gases will come out prematurely at the rear. Now, folks, this does not mean by any stretch that the race is over. Just because it's being red flagged, it's only being red flagged for now. The clock, however, continues to go, but on the pace set thus far, it continues to be a lap race. 394 laps will give us our 1,000 miles. However, it's 1,000 miles or 10 hours, whichever comes first, the clock keeps running. You know what that means, don't you? It'll be 10 hours, Doors. <laughs> we're, not get, we're not getting out of here anytime soon. <laughs> well, you have to spare a thought not only for the drivers and teams, but also our speed crew on pit road. Jamie Howe, we do feel for you. Take it away. I hope you guys are warm and dry up there in the booth because it's certainly not the case down in pit lane, but over the course of the race, we've already seen it. We've seen the wet conditions and we've seen the dry conditions. And when it's down to the wet conditions, it's all about grip. And what Michelin is saying is that they're giving their teams the most grip possible because the greater the grip, the better cornering that they have, the better uh, braking, the better power down. Michelin spends a lot of time testing and evaluating the construction and the compounds to provide the highest level of grip for all types of tires, including including the racing tires. Now teams can do their part by increasing the downforce and keeping the car and tires in check all throughout the course of the weekend. But Michelin certainly is doing everything that they can to provide a safe race for all of their teams. Now in the old days, there used to be as many as three different rain tires and they would be comprised of different types of tread as well as different types of compound. To keep the cost of racing down, they've mandated that only one rain tire can be brought. So what they do at Michelin is they bring a intermediate tire and the tread grooves aren't particularly deep so in this kind of condition they'll go now and they'll widen those tread sipes and they'll deepen them so that it turns into more of a full-on rain tire which right now trust me if they're on the racetrack i don't even know that that would work because this race track because of the elevation grows lakes at the bottom of all the hills and the other problem is dorsey of course we've had so much rain over the last 10 days or so that you know the ground is just saturated so it has nowhere to go it's literally flooded and as soon as we get heavy rain like this it just sits on the racetrack and this racetrack was we resurfaced a couple of years ago and it doesn't seem to be as porous the water just seems to sit there now 
We're going to see a lot of that too as we go on. We'll see those puddles. Water is the topic, and that's exactly what Chris Neville's going to talk about. Chris? Well, Dorsey, you were thinking that there might be a, a, a filter in that fuel cell on the three car that would separate the water. Check back in with Dan Binks, and he said, no, there isn't. But he said, it's the interesting thing about using E85 is there's so much alcohol in there that it will actually drag the water right through the engine. Now, the car might miss a little bit. They will lose a little bit of horsepower. But all in all, it really doesn't affect it like using the old-time fuels. He also said he doesn't think it's the exhaust that is dragging. He thinks it's a seam on the floor of the car, a metal seam that holds the floor together that's dragging right now. Yeah, they're going to take a look at it here in pit lane. They're not going to be able to touch the car, but they're at least going to be able to take a look, see what the problem is, diagnose it, and see once we get back to green flag racing, they're going to have to take it behind the wall and fix it. Ironically, Danny Binks and the Corvette boys, of course, with all of the monitors and things they have down there, they watch our broadcast, and they saw what I was talking about, and we're not aware of it. They saw the sparking from underneath that, and they were going to bring uh, the three car in as a result. Dan Binks on top of his game, no question. How about at the Racy Ferrari camp, Jamie? Well, Jamie Malo, you're out of the car. You have the good seat right now, but this Reese team always seems to find a way to do well in the endurance races. Why is that? I mean, I think the strategy guys are, are really good, and um, like on this situation, we we are basically a lap ahead of everybody. So I think that's that's our key, good strategy, consistent drivers, and uh, so hopefully it's going to work this time as well. You've had a lot of success in the endurance races under mixed race conditions. What's the key to doing well in a race like this one? Keep the car on the track, uh, no issues, and uh, be consistent without uh, any like contact uh, or any problem. So I think uh, we are doing well, and uh, hopefully, uh, like I said before, we can uh, we can keep a good pace on the wet, on the dry conditions. So I'm I'm confident. You guys were the first ones to go to those wet tires, but you yourself um, doing a lot behind the wheel of the car. When can we expect to see you back in? What? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Maybe an hour, two hours, maybe. We don't know how, how the races start again. So I, I think about a one hour and a half, maybe two. All right, and Chris Neville, who's at your end? Well, we're not talking to anybody. We're just crawling underneath the three car right now, seeing what exactly is dragging. And that is actually part of the metal seam that holds the floor to the bottom of the car. Team has been over here taking a look, too. They obviously can't touch it right now. But uh, it actually, it, from my, my standpoint, it doesn't look like something that's going to need to be fixed maybe once we get back under green. Uh, we're going to take a, a ch I'm going to talk to some officials and see if we can crack the door on Johnny's car and actually talk to him. Yes, you heard the radio communication earlier, and I believe it was from Corvette Racing uh, or perhaps Audi. Boys, don't touch the car, don't work on the car. Come on in. The guys are going to pull it up in pit road. We are under a red flag for those of you just turning on live here on speed. Red flag at Petit Le Mans. The clock, however, keeps on ticking. Speed's coverage of the American Le Mans series is brought to you by the million mile tested, million mile proven Mazda 6. If you can believe it, it is raining even heavier as the boys take shelter the best they possibly can as we welcome you back to Speed's flag to flag coverage of Petit Le Mans. There is a, an estimated 30 minute red flag period but we will continue to monitor that for you. Our broadcast will not stop and nor will the clock. If you've just joined us, watch what happened at the beginning of the race. The car on the right hand side, it's the Audi R15 of Alan McNish, who goes right around the outside of Pedro Lamy. That was fantastic. He said he opened up the space, he wasn't fast enough and I took full advantage. It was wonderful. The Corvette Racing machine took the lead in GT2 away from Dave Murray's and the the Robertsons and the muscle milk Porsche was flying at the hands of Klaus Graf after starting on pit road these guys seem to be in a class of their own they were flying until this Klaus spun off on the grass it went backwards and ended up going backwards even more as far as the timing and scoring is concerned. Check this out. First major contact between John Phil and Gilles Deferrin. That caused rear end damage on the XM radio Deferrin Acura. And that was just the beginning of their problems. Yeah, they really just had a disastrous day. And they're just trying to stay in the fight here today in terms of scoring some points. BMWs have looked awfully strong here today. Not so much when it was raining, but as soon as it started to dry out, they're immediately affected by Joey Hand's car going to the garage. And then Scott Dixon, just about 10, 15 minutes into his stint, 
had some braking issues down into turn five, lost control, again, heavy damage to the front of the 66 car. Whether that was related somewhat to that accident. Speaking of accidents, check this out. Chris McMurray in the Autocon Lola. That was a huge contact, but Chris was okay. And that's the most important thing. However, that car has retired. Then the rain came. Heavy stuff. Some teams made the switch nice and early to the wet weather tyres. The two Peugeot cars, one and two in the race, did not. And then a wild ride for Johnny O'Connell. Yeah, he was a lucky boy here. The t speed that he was taking coming off the racetrack there got caught by this gravel trap. Has lost a lap. They've got him pulled out, cleaned off. He's got something dragging on the car. And at the very same time, this is the 88, the Drayson Racing, their new prototype machine, taking a glancing blow here down the front straightaway. Looks like they got away with that one, and red then the red flag the was out. Come down and look at it. Nobody touched there was the radio communication from multiple teams to their respective teams, from multiple drivers, I should say, to their teams, including Alan McNish, a multi-time champion, and Petit Le Mans race winner to say, hey, this is not on. This is too dangerous at the moment. We need to uh, at least put out the caution. That happened, and then the red flag followed thereafter. Well, this is certainly an area rich in motorsport history, not only from the driver's point of view, but from the engineering side as well. And Lanier Technical College is well known to those who regularly visit Road Atlanta and involved in motorsport, and it's certainly well known to Johnny O'Connell. It's the Lanier Technical School, and uh, there's a motorsports training program there. You know, in racing, everyone wants to be a driver. Most guys do, but there are not so many seats available. So, you know, there's it's, it's a way for young guys coming up that love racing to, uh, to learn about all the technical aspects of it. And so they've got guys that are, uh, you know, they're learning engines, they're learning gearboxes, they're learning setup. And, and one of the very cool things that they do is that when, when they have events nearby, whether it be us here or, or the dragsters are in town or the NASCAR guys are in town, you know, they, they get a, a couple of other guys on the teams. And, you know, here at Corvette Racing, we've got two of their guys coming up so that they can get a, a, a real feel for, uh, for how a race team works on a weekend and uh, all the responsibilities of the different guys. And so, you know, it is an opportunity for them to really experience what racing is like uh, from the inside. Just in the American Le Mans Series field, there are about 20 students of uh, Lanier Technical College here. And there are some interns on those uh, the teams in the graphics. There are some here with Atlantic and uh, Star Mazda teams as well. The institution offers a degree and a diploma course covering uh, chassis setup, vehicle dynamics, fabrication, basic and advanced, fuel cooling, lubrication systems, drivetrain systems, electrical systems. This is wonderful stuff. I mean, in the old days, older days, you had to kind of do it the hard way, go and knock on a door and ask for a job. Here you can get the proper training, then go and give your resume to various teams and get hands-on training here at the racetrack. Chris, it's a great initiative, great institution. Yeah, it is, and Johnny O'Connell's not only finding shelter, but higher ground, the rain is coming down. Johnny, we just saw that piece about the technical college. How important is that for young young kids now coming out of high school and wanting to get into racing? Yeah, that's really important, man. I appreciate you guys after I just buried the car on a beach, you know, <laughs> asking me about that. You know what, they're, they're, uh, it's very cool what they do there, and there are a, a bunch of different places that offer young guys coming up different opportunities to get into motorsports. So, you know, the fact that uh, Corvette Racing is a part of that program and able to help out some guys. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Did you think you were going to get off that easy about the beach? <laughs> now, come on, you've got more experience around here than probably any other driver. What happened? You, you know what, really, uh, to be honest with you, that, that was rain like you've never seen before. And uh, and I was, you know, just holding the same pace as the car in front of me coming underneath the bridge. And uh, and I don't know whether it was a stream or, or the, the rise or what, but I just, you know, got sideways and uh, there was no saving it. So, uh, it, uh, you know, it's a shame you hate it. Luckily, the number four car is still in there, but uh, it uh, looks like the Reese boys coming in early. You know, their, their rain predictors were a little bit better. We're seeing a great battle shaping up right now in GT2. We got Ferrari, BMW, Porsche, Corvette. How's this thing going to shake out? I tell you what, it's really cool. You know, we're we're very excited. You know, there's a there's a reason Corvette Racing is is here, and it's to uh, to compete against uh, you know our our competitors on the showroom floor. And uh, you know, with the win at Mossport and the and the previous three races we've done well, we've shown pretty darn well here until I became a bonehead. You know, but. Uh, you know, the four car's still in it, and hopefully uh, hopefully we have a good rest of the race. Well, the, the three car might get back in it, too. And it looks like the team isn't going to have to fix the floor, so that's not going to be an issue once we get back to racing. Jamie? 
Well, Chris, down at this end of pit lane, it is raining so hard. We are getting wet underneath the awning for Flying Lizard Motorsports. But, York Bergmeister, you guys have a championship to worry about. So what's the strategy as we go back into this race? Are you guys going to be aggressive at all? Well, I guess we have to be now. Um, the Ferrari has a one lap lead now on us. Um, they made a smart call on, on, the, on the rain tires, on the yellow. Uh, so we'll see. Hopefully they're going to restart the race and um, hopefully we can make up some places. And Patrick, it's not really your driving style to, to hold back. You're a good aggressive driver. So when can we see you back behind the wheel and how hard are you going to fight? Well, I guess I'll have to get back behind the wheel because I was in when we went red, but I only had about a lap and a half on slicks this whole day. I started off in the wet in the opener and then uh, we went back to wets pretty quick here, but it's torrential out there right now. You can see the prototypes couldn't keep it on the track. So uh, we'll wait this out and see what's going on, but certainly we got our, our work cut out for us now. And Patrick, you have experience in the prototype class as well. So does that give you a little bit of extra patience and a little bit more of a better understanding when you're on track and in traffic? Yeah, actually, for those guys, the visibility isn't too bad, but it, you, you, I'm sure you hear them talking about it. As soon as there's a little bit of standing water, the floors make so much aerodynamic suction that it just literally takes the wheels off the ground and you're just along for the ride. So right now, uh, boats might be handling better out there than cars. So uh, we'll see if this Atlanta weather gives us a little bit of a chance. But I'll tell you, my shock doctor gear today is giving me the biggest workout ever. Um, usually it's dry and sweat, but today it's dry and rain. All right, I'm just going to have a lot more rain to dry because this rain is not letting up just yet. Good to hear from the GT2 boys, and just look at that. That tells the story in a single shot. Wow, and that's coming out of Chris Neville's boot. <laughs> <laughs> now, here we are with the GT2 points. We've got one and a half rounds to go, and the Flying Lizard boys, who we just heard from, currently fifth at the moment on the road. Now, remember the scenario going into this race. The 45 just had to finish one position ahead or one position behind the Risi Ferrari. Now, it doesn't matter if that Risi Ferrari is a lap ahead and the 45 finishes second. It doesn't matter that there's a lap difference. They just have to finish one position behind them to clinch. That's easier said than done. Yeah, because right now they're fifth in line in the GT2 class, and they've got a lot of fast cars right in front of them, of course. They've got very fast Porsche and also one of the Corvettes, one of the BMWs. Ferrari leads, great call by Rick Meyer there, bringing the boys in, switching to wets, gave them a heads up. Not only would we like to thank all of the IMSA officials, we would like to thank all the corner workers and volunteers helping make Petit Le Mans 2009 what it is and for handling this bizarre weather. need to remind you that after we are done here from road atlanta it is the nascar camping world truck series coming up live on speed from las vegas getting down to a crucial stage in the championship and we look forward to that i want to tell you something pretty interesting from vegas cal the greatest of all time on two wheels in motocross and supercross ricky carmichael was second quickest in the second practice session in vegas in the trucks that's pretty cool that is really cool it's going to be fun to watch him compete but uh, a lot of thumb sums being uh, worked on right down in pit lane because uh, if we don't see much more action here today, that 70% rule really has a dramatic effect. We're, we're looking at some math here right now. Simon Pagino in the 66 machine has done 136 laps, and the leader currently has 184, so it's going to make them pretty tight on that 70% mark. I think they're just in by maybe six or seven laps, but uh, we'll check into that. We know that many of you have just turned on and turned on at various times. You'll notice that the clock at the top of your screen continues to tick away. That's right. Clock does not stop. It keeps going. It's 10 hours or 1,000 miles, whichever comes first. To Chris Neville. El Pujo teammates Nick Manassian and Pedro Lamy down here having a little giggle. Now, Pedro, you had just gotten behind the wheel when the rain started coming down. So when we go back to racing, do you want to take it out or are you going to put Nick back behind the wheel? I... I would like to put him, but he, he doesn't want to. No, actually he wants, but uh, it's not possible. I have to restart when the race comes back. We were just talking to some of the GT drivers about how difficult those cars are in the rain, but really the prototypes, much more difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. And um, I mean, the, the race starts in the wet, difficult conditions, and then become dry, difficult conditions as well to decide when to put the slicks. And, uh, and now was a nightmare. I mean, with the slicks, when the start's a big rain, was a miracle to arrive in the box. And then um, when I, I restart with the wets, after a few laps, was big rain. It was impossible to be on the straight uh, in more than third gear. So it was good that they decided to stop the race. When we started the race today, 
Alan McNish went around the outside in turn one when it was a wet racetrack. Peugeot fought back, now has the lead again, but now we're back to a wet racetrack. How is the 908 going to be against the R15? Well, I think the, the Audi, the R15 are a bit fast in the wet because uh, actually they test here before the, um, the this week. They, they had the Saturday, Sunday test in the wet, so they had a better car. They knew what to do with the car for these conditions. And uh, for us, uh, it's uh, um, everything uh, a surprise to, to be... To, to, to know what to do with the setup. I mean, actually, in the past, uh, Audi is very fast in the wet comparing to us. So we're improving, but uh, the beginning of the race, we are not fast enough. What can you improve with the car to make it better in the wet? Oh. And, and now the guys in the 08 car are having a little fun with you. Yeah, yeah, always. We have a good uh, <laughs> Because they think they won the race, but. Now, <laughs> now, can, can you improve the car and make it better in the wet? Yeah, I think we can improve. I mean, uh, um, the car, it's, uh, we improve a lot since the past and maybe for this track we, are, we don't have a very good car and the tires we have, it's the um, 2008 tires that are not the best for our car so the uh, 2009 wets are better so I think we are more competitive than the past already but uh, we have to improve, I mean it's possible traction control is very important and um, mechanical grip, I don't know everything uh, everybody wants to have we need to, to improve as well. Well, guys, when I initially walked over here, I told these guys, we we're going to get back to racing in about five or ten minutes, and they looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. Frank Montani popped his head over and said, hey, why don't you guys take the car out and have a little bit of fun? You know, the problem isn't really the rain per se. It's the amount of uh, the puddling that goes on here. When these cars are at speed, you know, they get sucked down to the ground with the downforce. They don't have very much ride height. And, of course, some of these puddles are deeper, in fact, than what that ride height is. What happens is as the front of the car goes in, it lifts the car up. It loses traction to the road as well as it loses the downforce because it opens a big air gap underneath. It's totally undrivable. I mean, there's nothing you can do. No driver can drive in that condition. There is only one guy here who has done all 12 Petit Le Mans, and that is John Field. He's standing by with Jamie. John Field, you have competed in each race here at Petit Le Mans. This one has got to be one of the most treacherous conditions. Which one's your favorite? Well, it's certainly not this one because we've lost an engine a day, but uh, there's many. We, you know, our first year here when we were just a little team and really didn't know if we were, you know, we belonged here, but uh, probably 2003 and 2005 when I won it, the event and... Uh, just, you know, driving with Clint the last few years here has been obviously very fun for me. Now, you've been a member of the series since it began as well. A tremendous amount of growth over the last couple of years. How surprised have you been with that? It's awesome, man. I mean, the factory efforts here are, you know, second to none. And, you know, we, we get a big kick out of uh, participating with them. And we do the best we can. And uh, it's, it's awesome. I think next year is going to be another step forward with the equipment that's coming. It should be awesome. Now, seeing the big battles out on track with the factory power of Audi and Peugeot, you had a little bit of an incident earlier with the 66 car. What happened? Yeah, I was probably a little optimistic there. I mean, there was a dry line, and I had committed to pass Jill, and uh, it was just gray and uh, very slippery, and it slid into him, and I regret it, you know, apologized to him and all. But uh, one of those things. Over the course of the last couple of years, you guys have changed cars many times. You've been in a number of different prototypes. And with the announcement of the new prototype challenge next year, what are your plans to continue? Uh, we we want to try to get one of those cars. We have uh, several people looking at driving it. Uh, obviously, me and Clint will drive the Lola. We love the car. We're, uh, we've talked to Lola. They have some updates coming for it. So we think it'll be a, a better effort next year. The Dunlop tire has uh, come a long way. And AER is obviously a strong engine, as everybody's seen. It's really great down the straightaway. All right, a lot of improvements over the course of the year. Heartbreak today, but great history nonetheless. Captain America, as we like to call him, John Field. Mr. Excitement, he and his son Clint, of course, who is a uh, class champion in the American Le Mans series, and Brian Alder, their team manager. They all work really, really hard with limited resources, and they continue their support of the American Le Mans series. I'm going to step aside for just a little while, maybe grab a cup of coffee. Brian Till back on the other side of the break with Callan Dorse. Hey, take a look at this. 
EA Games new Need for Speed Shift. It's the new game from EA Sports, available in stores now. Need for Speed Shift delivers the true driver's experience with great cockpit view, deep career mode, and an amazing car roster. What's a deep career mode? It sounds like you, Dorsey. <laughs> they also worked in conjunction with Ray Hall Letterman racing driver Tommy Milner, who helped with the development of the game. It looks pretty cool. Deep career mode. I that love you and Dorsey's moves there. <laughs> yeah, it, oh my God. that looks like a short career move to me. <laughs> yes. Kind of look like Chris Neville and myself. Look at this mess. A boys. game the other night. Look at the rain, and it is coming down. And, you know, you guys talked about it. you got the rivers that go in across the track, but all this red Georgia clay gets pulled across the track as well. And speaking of red, that's not uh, pretty. No, it's coming our way. Well, here's the thing. It's rained for two weeks here. There's nowhere for this water yeah. to go. I mean, it's completely 100% saturated. And I'm wondering if my motorhome's not floating away down there next to the creek where we're parked. Uh, it's got an anchor out, I think. Good news is I don't have to turn my sprinkler system on for about the next month. No, well, you know, could. I mean, the area certainly needed the rain after the long drought it's had. And looking at Lake Lanier, it was actually full this year. It had been empty in years past. You know, we've talked a lot about the number nine car, the problems that Scott Sharp had in Thursday's practice, and just how much work had to be done. That crash happened about 4.30 in the afternoon. The car rolled on Saturday morning. Here's the crash if you're just joining us. You had not had a chance to see it yet. We were up here in the booth when it happened, and we were all just horrified. L just listen. I can remember we all looked up and just went, oh, no, oh, no. Interesting thing is there, boys. He tore the one of the wheels off on the Porsche. That was already off before he even got to the fence. I just noticed that. Yeah, his rear wheel got yeah. up here before the car did. There's the best thing about the crash. Scott Sharp yeah. climbing out. Amazing. It, just it, unbelievable. It, and he really didn't know what happened. Look at this time lapse for you. 24 hour time lapse. How long does it take to build a car? There's the foundation, the four liter Acura power plant. The new tub comes in 930 in the morning on Friday morning. And here we go. Just remarkable. It should be noted that tub was bare. Yeah, it wasn't prepped and ready to go. They had to glue the bobbins in that held a lot of the bodywork on. I mean, no wiring harness, no fuel cell, nothing. The One o'clock in the afternoon is what you're looking at is that motor finally got attached, the engine attached to the back of the monocoque. That, that tub had to be flown in from Honda development out in California uh, by private carrier, so I'm sure that wasn't cheap either. And when we saw Duncan Dayton immediately after the crash, he said, these are the only two cars in existence, the one we have that is now wrecked, and the 66, and then word came through that there was a tub sitting over in California, and suddenly they just sprung into action, literally. I think we were all surprised that the teams didn't know that another tub existed. Well, they didn't want to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> all phenomenal through the work. night. And we've seen all season long with this crew led by Robin Hill, just the chemistry, the passion. You don't see any whiners on that team. There's no moaning, there's no grumbling. They just get on with the program. And this, of course, was throughout the entire night. Boys didn't get any sleep. I think That's the word sure. that you used that was so pertinent was passion. I mean, they do have a passion for it. We've seen the team meetings, the huddle, just like a football team before the races. And I mean, this isn't like the old days, Dawson. These cars are so complex. I mean, the fact that they can put this thing together, all of the intricacies of all of the systems, the electronic power steering system, all of the electronics with the motor and, you know, all the ancillaries, just remarkable. They fired up this morning, went out, and haven't really missed a beat during the warm-up and during the race today. And it's not just nuts and bolts. I mean, these are particular, you know, these are machined bolts that have collars on them. They have different dimensions. They get skinnier to go through little bulkhead areas. I mean, it's just amazing to me that they had or they had found all of the things needed to get this car back together. To the setup pad, even taking time to put the decals down the front of the tub, making sure that everything was right. Of course, this car had to go through tech inspection again, have it completely checked out, and it passed with flying colors, obviously. The fluids were going in, the back end of the car goes on, and from the lone Acura 4-liter power plant that was sitting there comes a car. 4,000 mechanical parts, 250 electrical pieces. Calvin was right. Passion. It's the only way to describe what that team was able to do to create that car literally from nothing. Just a bunch of parts from the very beginning. What a job the Highcroft team did getting that car back together. Other guys out there doing a good job today as well, Chris, in very difficult conditions.
Yeah, and it was just a couple hours ago, Stefan serves and was a lap down, but Stefan, now you're leading the race. Are you surprised you guys were able to get back on the lead lap and now be leading so quickly? No, it was, uh, it was difficult at the beginning uh, with the rain, and after we put the uh, slick tires, we had the wave by, and uh, now we did a good, uh, good laps with no mistake at this moment, but it's uh, quite difficult and still very long. You've raced a lot of cars over your career. Lee Diffie's telling me that you've got an interesting pedal bike story. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, I'm doing a lot of uh, bicycle. I'm training a lot to be fit in the 908. And uh, yeah, I did a stage of Tour de France this year. It's every year for amateur race, uh, two or three days before the professional. And uh, we are 10,000. And I did this year. It was in the end of Le Mans Ventoux. It's a very uh, big uphill, 20K. And I finish uh, 92. Hey, Dorsey, that might be something good for you. I know you're interested in getting in shape. What do you think? Go run in a leg of the Tour de France? I got that 113 cubic inch uh, V-twin. I'll get up there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> great news there from the Peugeot camp. They're not the only ones working hard. We've seen great performances by other teams up and down pit lane. Jamie? It was great, a great battle early on with the number six car passing both Peugeots on the racetrack. Greg Pickett, talk about the progress that this team has made in such a short period of time. Well, they, the guys have done just a terrific job. I'm so pleased with our relationship with Porsche. The engineers, they loan to us and ship over to us. My buddy like Sasha here that comes and helps us, helped us test earlier. Nobody knows the car any better than he does, and he's just a wonderful guy. I'm just happy he's with it. So, yeah, I was. that's a big, big moment for me as a car owner. To, in that first stint, to go by the two factory Peugeots on the racetrack, that's monumental. You know, I mean, that's, come on, I'm a... SCCA Trans Ami guy, and that's that's really thin air for me. So it was delightful. You know, this this muscle milk, I think we're going to have to change it to Fountain of the Youth Milk or something because we loaded Klaus up with it, and he was just a tiger out there. I'm so proud of him and my guys and the team. I mean, I'm over the top. It's just wonderful. You mentioned Trans Am. You won the Trans Am race here at Road Atlanta earlier in the in this year. Uh, talk about how how advanced this RS Fighter is compared to any other other car you've driven. Well, I mean, thanks to development drivers like Sasha, honestly, it is one of the most lovely cars. It does everything. Where a Trans Am car, of course, has big power, pretty big tires, stops pretty good for its weight. This car does everything just spectacularly. And uh, it's such a joy for me to drive, like late in my career like this. It's the right car that's well-tested, well-prepared, and so much fun to drive. I mean, it's just uh, really great. These Michelin, let me, I, 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 it would be unforgivable if I didn't mention Michelin here with these wet tires that were just early in the race. They were just spectacular. I couldn't be more happy. And you mentioned Sasha Mawson helping the team out. Sasha, you were a part of the development of the RS Fighter. You've been with many different teams behind the wheel of this car. How does this team compare? Well, you just have to see the first hour. And uh, you saw that our car was uh, incredibly good in wet conditions. Uh, the only thing we don't have is horsepower because of the regulations. We have a lot less horsepower than uh, last year when I was driving with the Penske team. But uh, the handling is still the same. And uh, when the rain came, we were smiling and we thought, OK, we have something uh, that we can uh, look forward to. Right now, of course, it's a little bit too much rain, even for us. But uh, we hope it will be a little bit less. And then we continue the show, I hope. And I have to say, uh, the Saito Sport team is incredible. I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, not only Klaus and Greg are great guys, and uh, they are very fast, very, very fast. But also the team has learned really quickly. They have done, this is the third uh, race for the team, and uh, they have made good calls on the yellow. They have made no mistakes so far, so I'm really, really happy, and I hope we can continue and finish at least on the podium. We're very happy to see you back in the series as well. Thank you. Well, we've heard from two very strong teams down on pit lane, and perhaps teamwork is what Peugeot has used for their success as of late. It takes a team to get it done, and the series needs your help as well in selecting the move of the race. After the race, take the Paddock Pass poll on AmericanLamont.com to vote for the turning point of today's race. We want to hear from you at AmericanLamont.com. Talk about teams. It's not just the teams with the cars. It's the American Le Mans series team, the corporate office, that gets things done. When we come back on the other side of this break, we'll talk to Scott Atherton, the head of IMSA and the American Le Mans series. Back at Petit Le Mans, Road Atlanta, and unfortunately the only vehicles on the racing surface right now are safety vehicles inspecting the surface. Heavy rain, we've talked about that and chronicled it all day long. The rain that we've had throughout the last week, and you see 
the debris that's been washed onto the track and then the, the workers cleaning it off. And what a great job they've done over the last week just to make the racetrack not only accessible to the competitors, but to the fans as like. And speaking of fans, it's great to have Scott Atherton here with us. And I know that uh, the motto of the series is for the fans. And you guys did a great job. Plenty of fans out here today. It always amazes me how they do turn out for this event, even in inclement weather like this. And that's got to make you feel good. But let's talk a little bit about not only what we've seen today, but let's talk about the future as well. One of the things that you do is you host this state of the state address every year when we come here. Let everybody know about the American Le Mans series, how it sits, where we've been and where we're going. We had one of those the other day. We did. And uh, state of the series is uh, we're doing remarkably well, given the circumstances that we've all been through in the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, and I think the future is even brighter. We've, uh, I think the biggest news coming out of the state of the series regarding the future is uh, a bit of a class structure change. We're going to retain the DNA that has made the American Le Mans series the benchmark professional sports car racing series in the world, but now add a couple of classes that will make it more accessible and uh, potentially broaden the base of competitors that we have competing with us. So a lot going on there, and uh, with our rain delay, maybe we can get into all of them, but... Uh, I'll throw it back to you for the next question. <laughs> well, I mean, let's talk about the classes. You know, we, we've been used to seeing four classes of racing uh, over the years, and we know that that's going to change a little bit, but the magic number seems to remain four. One of the, the uh, things that you guys are going to do is you're going to combine the P1 and P2 classes uh, for 2010. And a lot of people kind of scratch their head and say, how can that happen? And yet we've seen competition between P1 and P2 over the last several years. That's exactly right. We're, we're effectively going to go back to what we did unofficially in 2008 in that season, where with some very subtle changes to the ACO technical regulations, we were able to put top level LMP2 and LMP1 cars effectively competing with each other. We're going to do that same thing for 2010, but in this case, it's much more official. You know, we've literally announced it. It's going to be a, 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 a formal process of us working with the manufacturers who are involved to balance the, uh, the technical capabilities of those cars to race as a single class, and they will race as LMP. The other LMP P class is the new entry that we've, uh, that we've launched here for 2010. LMP Challenge. So uh, we have one of those cars here with us this weekend. It's been on display. We have 16 drivers signed up to test that car tomorrow. Calvin uh, and Dorsey are on the list, right? Yeah, <laughs> actually, there are the alternates. <laughs> yeah, they're <laughs> the last two to go. <laughs> yeah. if, if, if there's anything left. Yeah, if there's fuel, daylight, <laughs> tires, maybe. Okay, okay. when it's like this, we may be first, though. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that car is a proper prototype it really is it's it's a very serious sophisticated race car um, it would be if you were to see it you'd say it looks like an LMP2 car and that's that would be an accurate description what's been done is it's been value engineered I mean literally the the parts that if it were an LMP2 car would be very lightweight and very expensive and they would have a certain amount of life to them those parts have been exchanged for something that's not as sophisticated not as tricky as they would say in racing and they're all going to be the same. So, you know, the, the purists of the American Le Mans series will come out of their chair at that and say, foul, foul, that's not right. And I would point out that, you know, the, the world that we operate in has changed fairly radically here. And especially that's true in the automotive industry. And the series has evolved. We've embraced change. We are looking at this as an opportunity to, as I've said, broaden the accessibility to other competitors. The initial reaction to this car has been nothing but positive. And, you know, most people look at it, even historical critics of us have looked at it and said, you know what, it's the right car for the times. Well, and the interesting thing is it is not a new car. It is run in Europe in, its, in this form with the Michelin tires that are on it. So it's a tried and true piece. Now, we talk about the American Le Mans series, and, and one of the things that has always been very strong in this series is the schedule. So let's talk schedule for 2010. I know a lot of people are very interested in that as well. Exactly. Uh, the schedule is very similar in terms of the venues and the numbers. We'll have a nine race season next year. The, uh, the one exception will be uh, St. Pete. And unfortunately, that's due to a date change that put that race, if we were to have included it, it would have been one week following Sebring. And with, with the logistics of coming out of a 12-hour endurance race and the just the realities of what it would take to prepare and do an effective job there. It just didn't make sense for us to pursue. The other real change is moving what has been our historic, uh, recent times at least, finale at Laguna Seca 
to a May date and also to expand that race into a six-hour endurance. So we will bookend the season with the Mobile One 12 Hours of Sebring, Petit Le Mans on the other end with a six-hour endurance race at Monterey in the middle. I love seeing Petit Le Mans at the end here at where it all started. And that, I, to me, that is very, very cool. Let's take a quick break. And then when we come back, I know that the Green X Challenge and looking to the future and alternative fuel sources is something that is very big for the series. It's all about technology, and it has been for a long time. So when we come back, more with Scott Atherton from here at Petit Le Mans. Hopefully, the rain will go away, and maybe we'll get back to racing at some point in time here in the future. Meanwhile, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back to Road Atlanta. Speed's coverage of the American Le Mans Series is brought to you by Acura, Acura, Advance, and by Stable. When you store, start with Stable. The skies are certainly dark here, but not the spirits of the fans who remain on the hill and not the spirits of Scott Atherton as we talk about 2010 and the future. But to look back a little bit, this fa the foundation of the series was really built on technology. And then over the years, we've seen it be built as well, especially last year on green, the future, the technology that exists out in front of us. And I think it's been so interesting to see alternative fuel sources, the E85, the E10, the diesel. But we've got more stuff coming, the biobutanol that we've seen this weekend. Let's talk about the, the greening of motorsports. I think we made history last year here with the first ever green challenge that was done along with our uh, collaboration that we have with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy. That has uh, has grown this year into all, all of our events featuring the Michelin Green X Challenge, which is the same competition within a competition as we started with last year. In, in brief, it rewards the car that goes the furthest, the fastest, with the least impact on the environment. When you look at the announcements that are coming out of major car manufacturers right now, you know, BMW's withdraw from Formula One, but they were quick to point out that they're not leaving motorsports. They're just going to focus on series that allow them to highlight relevant technology with an emphasis on the environment. We see the same thing coming from many of our other manufacturers. So the, the importance and the value of having racing with a purpose, having advancements and innovations that come out of these race cars that can directly align into the road car production car is what this series represents right now and four years ago when we made the decision to focus on this it wasn't nearly the mainstream popular subject that it is today and i think it's only going to become more popular and uh, frankly more valuable as time goes on who would ever thought you'd hear Porsche say, we're going to build an electric car? Yeah, exactly. And Scott, GT2 this year has really been a banner year. I mean, the backbone of the series, Porsche and Ferrari remain going down to the wire in the championship. And a year with the economy the way it is, you talked about BMW pulling out of Formula 1. They maintained their presence that they committed to in the series with GT2. Corvette, with GM in the state that they're in, they remain with their program. They're back for next year and already committed. And a new manufacturer announced this weekend. You've got to be very excited. I could not be more enthusiastic about that and the fact that the pipeline still has content in it. You know, it uh, on average, I, I would say it's three years from the point that the initial expression of interest from a manufacturer to the point if they follow the proper channels and procedures to the point that they have a car on the grid. It's a three-year process. So Jaguar making its debut this weekend, three years ago, those first conversations started. Um, you made reference to the BMW and the Corvette, you know, at a time when I don't know of any other racing series that is holding press conferences right now announcing new content. And we're fortunate to not only have the manufacturer involvement, but top level independent teams as well. Drayson Racing with their announcement of a full American Le Mans series LMP program next year. And if there was ever anyone focused and committed to using racing to improve the breed, to innovate as it relates to the environment, it's, it's Paul Drayson. So we've got good news to deal with now, and the best news I can give you is there's more to come. That's great. Uh, talking specifically about the racetrack, we've had rain in this area for the last 10 days. The last weekend, you had some testing that was washed out. What sort of state did you see the racetrack in then compared to now, and how long would it take to get this racetrack back in the shape that we need to uh, see a green flag here again today? Calvin, we had, I think, the worst rain in terms of the volume and the, the duration of it that I've ever seen. 
I, I grew up in Seattle, so I'm <laughs> fairly well versed on rain. And uh, imagine the hardest thunderstorm downpour you've ever experienced and then have it continue for three hours. And that's what last Saturday was. And we jokingly said, whew, thank goodness the race isn't today. And uh, unfortunately, we're a little too, too much in common this Saturday with last Saturday. To answer your question on how long to get back to a, a raceable surface, um, if the rain would stop right now with the equipment and the personnel we have, I would say it's, it's, we're an hour from racing. So uh, it, it could be sooner, but I'm concerned about the level of saturation that's occurred in the past week because we had, as I'm sure everyone is familiar with now, record-setting rain. Literally the 100-year rainstorm came through here in the past 10 days. We've got the best team in the in the business out there, and we've got the equipment. We brought the jet blower up from Sebring. So uh, the moment that this rain gives us any relief, we'll put it back in order. You think we can get Dr. Panos to build a roof over the place? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Dorsey Stadium? Removable? Cowboy Stadium? <laughs> you know, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I uh, hear you. <laughs> you know, the series has always been about partnerships, and that's something I know that you've worked very hard to build over the years. And Stanford University is a name that uh, rings in everybody's ear. They, they understand the best of the best when they hear the word Stanford. I know you've got a new partnership with them and also some other corporate partnerships that you'd like to talk about for 2010. Yes. we uh, Ironically, Stanford uh, contacted us, which was uh, pleasant. You know, it's not often that the phone calls are inbound. But they have a, a serious commitment to future automotive innovation, technology, the development of, and, you know, heard about what's happening within the American Le Mans series and have actually invited us out to give a presentation to their professors and to their students and uh, verse them on what's happening within the series. And we're going to join up with the EPA and the DOE and a couple of our uh, manufacturer partners and go out there in, in uh, about 10 days from now and uh, to try to give them a full immersion into the green challenge and just the whole initiatives of what are being accomplished within the American Le Mans series. And it's my dad's alma mater, so uh, you know, maybe I'll have a, a little bit of legacy uh, credentials out there. And your shoes may be dry by then. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other partnerships in 2010 that we well, we uh, know about? Yeah, we've just recently uh, confirmed a relationship with Freescale. And uh, for many people, that probably doesn't ring any bells, but uh, Freescale is a, a semiconductor manufacturer that uh, I could give you the technical definition of what they do, but the, the understandable definition is they make the electronics that make automotive, uh, you know, autos green. So emission control systems, fuel efficiency, that's what they do. And uh, they're partnering with us to do some seminars and some receptions that involve manufacturers and, again, are partners with the governmental agencies we work with. So there's a couple of more in the in the hopper that uh, aren't quite ready for uh, prime time, <laughs> but uh, that's what we're attracting, you know, sponsors and uh, corporate partners that are being attracted by the uh, the efforts that we're doing with green racing. Scott, this weekend we saw a dramatic crash here on Thursday with Scott Sharp going up towards turn two. Two things to me stood out there. A is the safety and the structural ability of these race cars currently, and secondly, the passion that's in this paddock for Duncan Dayton and his team to regroup and be back on the grid today. Uh, it has been the most amazing, uh, pleasantly, without injury to anyone, experience that I've, I've witnessed. And it covers every aspect of what happened. You're right. It was one of the most horrific racing incidents I've ever seen. When you look at what occurred there with the car doing exactly what it was intended to do, it protected that driver unbelievably well. You know, other than the enclosed capsule around the driver, the biggest piece of that car was the size of a dinner plate. The track did exactly what it was to do. The barrier was there. The catch fence was there. It contained the accident in exactly the area that it should be, should the unfortunate happen like that. Within minutes of that happening, because I was first in the medical center with Scott, found out he was completely okay immediately then went to Duncan, and I was one of many that were literally lined up offering help and assistance. Our Elon technology business is just down the road. We manufacture race cars. We have CNC machines, autoclaves. We were one of many that were offering up services. Um, fortunate, we, we felt good to be able to help him in making some parts. But, uh, you know, I, I talked about this last night. I had one of his crew members who I won't divulge, but he walked up to me that afternoon, that evening, and he put his hands on my shoulder and he says, you have to be so proud of the paddock you have here. And I thought he was referring to the world-class cars and the diversity and just what this Petit Le Mans represents. It had nothing to do with that. It was the 
passion and the spirit and the sportsmanship that had come out of this very unfortunate event. But the results, I just, it's, you know, it, it chokes you up when you think about it, you know, because uh, there isn't a lot of that that takes place, especially at such a high professional level where you've got millions and millions of dollars on the line here. But the, uh, the opportunity for everybody to not just express an interest in helping, but actually do it, uh, really something special. That's one of the things that makes this series so great, and you f you feel it on every weekend. It's great to have you here, Scott. Great to talk to you. It's always good to get an update on it. I know you're excited. We talked about the partnerships, G Oil, Mickey Moto Pearls that we were announced this year. Great to have you come by. Stop by anytime. I we'll probably talk to you at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca as well. We'll update weather when we come back. Well, the rain continues from Road Atlanta. The 12th running of Petit Le Mans dampened to say the least by the weather in the area and dorsey the red flag you can certainly understand it with the track conditions that are here yeah there's no choice but what they have to do they got to wait this out let this water drain they got jet dryers here and they'll make every attempt to get this back in shape but i would say it's going to be a half hour 45 minute uh, uh you know if it rain should stop I mean, at least 45 minutes is what we're being told by race officials. And we know you tuned in to see American Le Mans Series action, so we're going to show it to you during this red flag. When we come back on the other side of this commercial, we'll take you back to Mosport. We ran it earlier in the year, and we'll pick up just shortly after the green flag, Gilles DeFerrin trying to take over the lead. You wanted American Le Mans Series action. You'll get it here on speed, and we'll give you updates on a constant basis from Petit Le Mans. We are back live here at Road Atlanta uh, for the Petit Le Mans. And if you have been with us throughout the afternoon and evening, you will know that we have been doing half hourly updates just to keep you in the loop as much as it is for ourselves. And now, as we promised, we can give you a definitive decision. The race has been declared. So the weather has just been a little bit too much to get on top of. Hello again, Lee Diffie, along with Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader. Boys, an extraordinary day. Uh, the weather, as we know, in the state of Georgia, not just affecting this motor race, but the weather in the state of Georgia and Metro Atlanta has just been horrendous over the past two weeks. It's finally taken its toll on this event. It really has. It's a big shame because there's been so many fans here, even with the bad weather starting the day, that have stuck around to try and see some more motor racing here today. And um, Dorsey, we had a fascinating battle that was going to shape up in both the P1 category and GT2, and we're not going to see it happen. So very weird day indeed well the reality of it is this racetrack is just so fast and it's so dangerous under these conditions it's just you know you just can't resume there's just no way that these lakes out there are not going to go away in the next hour or so we have to be off the air before that so they did all they could do the big storyline though is that audi has never been defeated at petit le mans since they started competing here at road atlanta they were going for 10 from 10 that has not happened peugeot victorious finally justin bell has more well, Frank Montani, uh, I'd like to say a superb win. It was a superb drive to be in first place and probably the strangest win you've ever had as a team, correct? Yeah, 100% agreed. I mean, it was kind of difficult because at the beginning we had some problems with tires and we struggled with, uh, with the car, especially with the track, which was going drier and drier. But as soon as we put the, the dry, dry tires, he went, we went very fast and we, we just catch back as soon as fast as we could, you know, it was like qualifying, uh, qualifying laps all the time, and we, we really enjoyed it with uh, with Stefan. But so when you when you look when you come and and do a race like Petit Le Mans, it's a very challenging track, cor correct? You, I mean, very good preparation for you for for Le Mans next year, you think? Not for Le Mans because it's uh, it's a narrow track, it's short, but it's good for drivers, you know, to see how fast you can be and uh, how quickly you can get in in action because it's cold tires, the track is very difficult and a lot of traffic. The only problem is that it's a, it's a half race again, so we wanted to, to race for a complete one and uh, to fight uh, against the others for, for longer. And one statistic we just got told, I don't know if you're into records, the record book always says it, it doesn't tell the full story. You are, the 10th year would have been for Audi to win and, and you guys have beaten them. It, it shows how strong, how fast the team has come up. Uh, it's just the beginning. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Frank, you won the Petit Petit Le Mans. Yeah. Chris? <laughs> Well, I'm down here with a very disappointed Alan McNish. Obviously, we want to make sure things are safe out there, but just too much rain. How disappointed are you that you couldn't take another swing at the Peugeots? I just frustrated more than disappointed because uh, obviously it was very wet uh, when they called the race, and I think it was the right decision, even a little bit too late in reality because our cars were already going off. But uh, it's a very difficult decision to make. And uh, I kind of think like everybody else, we all 
really would like for it to have continued, including the Persia guys, um, but it wasn't to be in this occasion. Before we went to red flag, you had a couple spins out there. What exactly happened? Uh, the one mind, the pace car, just basically we lost all the tyre temperature. Pace car runs very slowly and it's cold here and all the tyre temperature went. And uh, the other one was just pure aquaplaning, Marco, and there's quite a few people off at the same time. And in fact, it was literally at that point that they threw the, the full course yellows. You've got to wait until potentially Sebring now to have another swing at Peugeot. Is it going to take a lot of patience to get to March? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I think we did a very, very good job today. We acquitted ourselves extremely well. If we were able to run the race duration, I think uh, we would have been in a very strong position to take the victory. But, you know, that wasn't to be as it's turned out right now. I just feel kind of, like I said, frustrated. Well, Audi's streak was broken at Le Mans in June, and it's broken once again today in Atlanta. So after 184 laps of competition, this is what the scoreboard, the results will say about Petit Le Mans 2009. What it shouts out is Peugeot, Peugeot, just the way it was at Le Mans. It is, but uh, Alan made that little mistake there under caution, and uh, that really cost Audi the victory because they would have been at the head of the pack as we went to red flag, and uh, that streak would have continued. And Dorsey, what a story as we go to the bottom of that graphic in sixth place, that Patron Highcroft Acura. That's an incredible story. That accident on Thursday was just a pure miracle to walk away from that. Scott Sharp being intact, a spare tub flown in, rebuilt overnight. Those guys did a fantastic job. As we scroll through the results, you can pick up car 66. That is, of course, the XM Deferrin Acura. That ninth place leaves the points open, to put it bluntly. Yes, well, there's bonus points at Mazda Raceway Laguna Sega, 25 points on hand. So certainly David Bram, Scott Sharp, they'll still be sweating it a little bit. Essentially, all they need to do is to start the race and get the minimum amount of laps for each driver, and they will be the champions. All right, there is another championship wide open as well, and it's because of the result from the Risi Competizione Ferrari. Let's go right there now with Kelly Stavist. And Lee, for a guy who claims to be quitting sports car racing, he continues to build on an impressive resume. Le Mans, Sebring, now here at Petit Le Mans, but, but it was really kind of a gutsy call that made the difference here tonight. It was, yeah. I, I could see behind the safety car that it was getting uh, really slippery. It was a little bit drizzling all the time, and uh, I could see that people were having problems to keep the type temperatures up. So I made a call to the team and I said, I think we should go for wets, because uh, at, the, at the restart it's going to be a big mess. Everybody's going to go off, and uh, with the wets I can at least uh, be more safe. And one, lap, one and a half lap later it started raining like hell, and I had a wet zone. And, that was it. We gained uh, nearly two laps on it, and uh, we won the race. And because you won the race, still in the championship, what does it mean for you to help, you know, your old team stay in this championship hunt? Of course, it's good for the team. I don't actually care because I'm not winning the championship myself. But uh, <laughs> but it's good for them, and they have, still have a shot at it at uh, Laguna. We love your honesty. Thanks, Mika. Thank you. And jokingly, Mika calls himself Reese's lucky charm, and perhaps maybe he is. And there aren't too many teams that can boast this record. They won Le Mans last year, they won Petit Le Mans last year, they won Sebring this year, they won Le Mans this year, and now they've got five big ones in a row by winning Petit Le Mans. Extraordinary. Extraordinary streak, but a lot of great cars in the race today. BMWs looked awfully strong. Corvettes once again. And Porsche are hanging in there. Certainly top five result for Bergmeister and Long really keep them in charge of this championship. But uh, there's a lot to play for next year. The 2010 season will be sensational. Dorsey, you will be at Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca in two weeks' time. This is what you're going to be talking about with Brian Till. Championship, championship, championship. It is still open. Of course, it's much tighter now than it was before. The Ferrari, that call for the tires, won that race for them. Now it's a real crapshoot going into this last race. They're going to work hard, these two cars. That margin has been reduced from 31 to 19 points. How about that? It is Porsche over the Ferrari. Bergmeister Long trying to be champions. What can Kaffa and Mello do? We will see. It's exciting stuff. We're not done here yet, though. Stick around. We'll have more from Road Atlanta. Speed's coverage of the American Le Mans series is brought to you by Acura, Acura, Advance, and by Need for Speed Shift. In stores now, rated everyone. We're back to wrap things up from Petit Le Mans for 2009, this event presented by Mazda 6, and it certainly will be an event to remember for a variety of reasons, but because of this ex very extended uh, stoppage period because of the inclement weather, 
and of course the extraordinary circumstances surrounding it. We've told you about P1, we've told you about GT2. Now let's hear from our winners in P2. Capturing their second win of the season is Marino Franchitti in the number 20 Dyson Racing Mazda. Marino, this is the first endurance win for the manufacturer. How big of a relief is this for you? Uh, it's a huge relief for all of us at BP Dyson Mazda Racing. Obviously, to win a race presented by Mazda 6 is huge for us. We're delighted, and it's just another step on the, the road of developing this car. Uh, it was a, a, We had a problem with the, the gear actuator, and we were stuck in sixth. The guys fixed that really quickly, and I think we were f five laps down at that point, and we made up like three laps in an hour, some through strategy, some through just raw speed on the track. And to get pole and then the win is just fantastic for this this whole team, and i got to thank you know both teammates, Butch and... Uh, ben, they dealt with some really tough conditions out there and yeah, just very, very happy. With the conditions on track and the issues that you guys were having in the car, do you feel like if the race would have continued that the problems would have as well? No, uh, we solved the problem there and then and it was very early and then we just started our comeback and I think uh, Adrian was leading at that point and had some problems. But the rate we were shutting them down, we'd have had them even before this uh, delay st started. So. Yeah, I couldn't be happier. Sorry for the fans that it ended this way with the rain, but uh, being from Scotland, I'm kind of used to this. Uh, sorry I brought the weather with me. All right, with this race being sponsored by Mazda and the next one at Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca, congratulations and good luck. Thank you. Second win of the season for the 20 car for Dyson Racing. We congratulate uh, not only Marino, but Ben Devlin and Butch Lightsinger as well. So a very good result. Well, I think there is one uh, big positive to come out of this as far as the American Le Mans Series P1 Championship is concerned. We know what happened with Patron Highcroft Racing, that horrendous crash. We know of the uh, trials and tribulations that occurred with the 66 car today. They both still have a fair shot at this championship, and I'm sure Jill DeFerrin will be delighted with that. That's exactly right. It wasn't the day that you had hoped for, but your chances at the championship still alive. So what do you take away from today and move forward to Laguna? I'm extremely disappointed, you know, that uh, we were doing everything right. Uh, someone that had nothing to do with the championship and uh, was a lap behind us uh, really ruins our, our, our chances in the championship. This is a very important race for us. Uh, and uh, we had a golden opportunity to, to close our gap and, uh, and for no fault of our own to be in this position is uh, to say the least disappointing but you know we go to, to Laguna with our, our heads high and, uh, and, and, and we we'll do the best we can so uh, all we can do is try to win the race and, and, and see what happens which is effectively what we keep doing here day after day. Did you hope to get back out here on the track or do you think the right decision was called to, to throw the checkered flag? I mean, it's, you know, the conditions were uh, really deteriorating throughout the afternoon, so uh, I wasn't going around the track to see uh, how bad it got, but um, I think they probably made the right call. Right. Best of luck at Laguna. Thank you. Well, it's understandable, Gilles. Uh, disappointment uh, with what went down today uh, with he and John Field. Fairly heavy contact early on in the race. Yeah, and uh, I mean, John Field is John Field. He gives it 100%. He admitted he made a mistake. Conditions were tough. He has a lot more straightaway speed. He made the move down the straightaway and then got on the grey, whereas Gilles was on the dry part of the racetrack. And the Acura has more downforce anyway under braking. So an understandable racing incident. I know Gilles is very disappointed, and it really kind of makes this championship almost impossible for them. But uh, just one of those deals, I feel. Yeah, I think he really wanted to try and seal the deal or get it certainly a lot closer today that's for sure Dawes we got uh, Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca in two weeks time what are your thoughts heading there the final race of the American Le Mans series well uh, it's going to be a great race out there you know clearly right now the advantage goes to, um, you know with the nine car in, in P1 and, and certainly uh, GT2 with the the Ferrari has got a chance now which I didn't think it was going to have so I mean these long distance races unfortunately sometimes throw you a curveball and did to some of these teams this weekend you know, it leaves you with a bunch of ifs and what ifs and, and uh, unanswered questions. And I don't think we'll uh, get those answers until see bring them next year, unfortunately, when these great battles resume. Well, we were very excited about Audi versus Peugeot. It was super bout number three for this year. I guess we're just going to have to wait until the 12 hours of Sebring 2010. But, of course, we can wait. We'll be patient. We'll get extra excited about that. The Monterey Sports Car Championship, as we said, from Mazda, Ray, Mazda Raceway Laguna Se Seca. You can see that October 11th right here on Speed, and that's from 2.30.
Well, we really appreciate your patience today. It was a weird old day, that's for sure. It's not our typical Petit Le Mans. And coming up after this, we've got the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series from Las Vegas. Lots going on in that championship. What a day. It started with a lot of questions. And I guess in some regard, it has finished with a lot of questions. But we will remember Petit Le Mans 2009. We congratulate Peugeot on their win. The first to defeat Audi in P1 competition. And the most important thing, the championships are still alive, heading to the season finale. On behalf of the entire speed team, a big thank you to our crew who were out in the rain. And we thank you for watching Sports Cars on Speed.